Well, hello and welcome to the daily edition of the DC Today, your daily market recap. And uh, contrary to popular belief, every now and then markets can rally. And you had one of those days today, uh, even in the midst of a bear market, you had a lot of upside momentum, but it didn't start that way. Last night, the Nikkei at one point was down 600 points, well over 2%. And although after the time I went to bed, it came back a bit, it closed down one and a half percent, 397 points. So um, you, you, I definitely woke up to a very challenged market. And here's what uh, happened. And it did not create the rally in markets right away. Um, but I want you to think back to what I said yesterday about my working theory that the liquidity coming out of the financial system and the upward pressure on U.S. bond yields and really all sovereign bond yields globally um, was putting the Fed in a very difficult position and that the Fed was likely going to use quantitative tightening to blink before the Fed funds rate. Well, I think it was 3.40 in the morning Pacific time that I started getting pop-ups and beeps and bulletins about the Bank of England actually announcing that they were going to use bond buying <clears throat> as a mechanism of stabilizing their currency and, and bond yields. Okay, they have been doing quantitative tightening and they announced they were going to do, when they call it bond buying, that's called quantitative easing. Within 24 hours, what I said about our Fed, so it's a different, I didn't like get a prediction right. I'm just pointing out that another major country one day later, did the same thing I was talking about yesterday. So I think that it helps reinforce a little bit about the central bank thinking that of the two major policy tools they've all quadrupled down on and are now having to unwind, and that is the zero bound interest rate and the quantitative easing, the reversal of those two policy tools the one that is easiest to kind of slow walk is quantitative tightening because the, frankly, the political class and most of Main Street doesn't understand it, gives them the ability to effectively waffle on what they've said without it being so clear, without it being so obvious. So I, don't, I, I can't say right now that the Fed has done what I said they're going to do. I do feel quite confident that that is a logical theory. But I thought it very important to point out that the Bank of England, in fact, is doing it now and saying, and once we stabilize things, we'll go back to our tightening. But it's quite uh, odd to be in the middle of m selling bonds in the marketplace to announce you're going to start buying bonds um, it, it, to stabilize your financial system. But again, the U.S. stock market rally today was probably more of a simple relief rally. Things were, were significantly oversold. Um, when you have the largest market cap company in the U.S. down, uh, Apple is the largest market capitalization company in the United States, and it uh, was actually negative over 3% at one point. I think it only closed down over 1%. But my point being, that is quite a rally when um, you have a company down like that, and yet the breadth of what everything else was was so significant. Energy was up over 4.4%. And again, technology was the worst performing sector, but it was up almost 1%. It was up 0.92. And if you, all of that uh, attribution of why it wasn't more robust than ASDAQ was up 2% would have been because of Apple uh, effectively kind of being weighed down by what they, uh, apparently the reports are rumors of demand weakness and lowering the production plans for their new phone. So I'll, I'll save Apple commentary for another time, but that's kind of the explanation. Um, so the overall story, S&P up about 2%, Dow up 550 points, up almost 2% as well. Um, and I, the other thing I'd point out, the Dow being up 550 should be the end of the story. But again, it gave up 120 points. It was up 670. It gave up 120 in the last five minutes. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is to make it abundantly clear to listeners, especially those of you that are clients of ours that are engaged in our philosophy and smart enough to know that these technical day-by-day -day things are just so stupid, so dumb. But to get a better understanding of how markets work, 
you have a technical factor putting major downside pressure in the closing minutes uh, most days right now, and it's and it's sizable. Okay, so if one of us wants to jump on a screen and sell millions of dollars of stock, and for some small investors, it could be thousands of dollars, whatever it is, obviously that can't move markets. But to see 120 points go away in five minutes, there is either ETF factors, large option covering, short, uh, uh, and it could go either way, positions being taken off that are levered or put on. It isn't important. I always get to find this stuff out in hindsight, but I don't get to know it in advance or in real time. But I just want to make clear that the additive volatility late day is clearly coming from extraneous circumstances. And I bring it up because it speaks to extraneous factors, technicals, and movements in the market. Um, public policy, Senator Joe Manchin, indeed, he uh, went out with a blaze of not glory on this one. He's not getting his promised pipeline, his energy provisions. Uh, he had to pull from the conditional resolution to fund government. It ended up passing once he pulled his adjacent connected bill that he would, was promised. He was unable to get enough Republican support and enough Democrats uh, killed it that um, he did not get any of the things that he had traded his climate spending bill for. So I'd, I've been watching politics a long time. Uh, I don't say that braggingly because I'm I actually am ashamed of it. But in my um, entire life, I don't know that I've ever seen a senator get played this badly. And what happens next really is going to depend on what happens to Senate leadership. I think Manchin still has a chance of getting some version of what he wants done in a lame duck session if there is a change in Senate control. Uh, but I don't know how you can kind of handicap where these things go until you, on Manchin's particular bill until you know um, what Senate leadership will be post-election. Other policy news real quickly before I move to housing is that uh, there are reports again, and they were circulated not just in Fox, but also Bloomberg, CNBC, all financial media, and no denials that came out that all three, Treasury Secretary Yellen, uh, Brian Reese, who is President Biden's National Economic Council director, the same role that our own Larry Kudlow had in the prior administration, Reese has in the Biden administration at the NEC, and then Cecilia uh, Roos, who is the head of the uh, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, that all three would be planning to leave their positions after the midterms. Now, there was not confirmation of the support nor denials. But it was from credible sources, reported multiple outlets, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't have any confirmation to give you, but I think that would be very interesting. Uh, it's not at all surprising when one goes after midterms. It's not at all surprising when all three wouldn't make it through a whole four-year term. But if they're all three going to be going in unison after the midterms, um, that would be interesting to see what kind of shakeup it would create in the economic policy portfolio of the Biden administration. Okay, the national rent report came out for uh, the prior month showing a 0.2% month over month drop in rents. The median rent of residential living this is the first time the national median rent has declined in over two years. Wasn't a huge decline, but again, even though I don't expect to see this into the inflation data, it most certainly is going to um, have a lag and yet is putting disinflationary uh, pressures uh, into housing. Um, speaking of which, the average cap rate right now for apartment buildings is about, uh, well, before today, because the 10 year got hammered, uh, the 10 year rallied huge today, the yield got hammered. Um, what it was about uh, 25 basis points. And I mean, just think about that. The spread between the average uh, cap rate of an apartment building and a 10-year treasury bond was a quarter point. And let's say today it's now half a point because the 10-year yield was down uh, 25 basis points. Uh, that's the smallest in history. And it would be very difficult to see uh, a lot of those economics penciling. And it puts a lot of downside risk into the asset class uh, if cap rates are that uh, low. 
Um, now, the 30-year mortgage came out at 6.52%, the average. That's a new um, a high in this cycle. And the volume of refinancings were down 89% from a year ago. That's a 22-year low. Uh, not a big surprise the rates this high. Uh, because the Bonser Group's main office is in Newport Beach, even though there are people listening all over the country and we have offices in five different states, and uh, clients in well over 40 states and listeners in uh, dozens of countries. I don't mean to, I, I only say Orange County because it's still kind of a certain amount of hub for us, but I just wanted to say to those of you in the Orange County residential market, um, the volume of activity last month for sales was the third slowest August. It doesn't help a lot to say like something was the third slowest month because some months are naturally going to be slower in other months, but apples to apples, um, it's the third slowest August since 1988 in volume. That's a pretty long period of time, almost 35 years. And median prices for the whole county are now down 6.6% since the month of May. So in three months, you've had over a 6% drop in median prices and a significant drop in volume. And I bring that up because Orange County is an affluent county and generally thought of in a more protected zone of pricing. And yet uh, my working thesis here is that unlike most credit-oriented financial crises, because I believe this is going to be an affordability and valuation-driven adjustment, I think the most expensive property is the most vulnerable. Is housing going the way of 2008? No, no, no. I say it all the time. Even one who believes we're due for a long overdue correction, we're not talking about 2008 circumstances. You have to remember that 80%, this is just a disgusting statistic, 80% of mortgage volume in 2007, late 06, early 07, right at the peak of that, what became subprime crisis, 80% of it had sub 760 FICO scores. So credit scores that were either not great, but okay, or flat out bad. 80% of all mortgage volume nationally. Today, it's less than 35%. So you just have an entirely different credit profile and an entirely different um, equity position. And of course, you have an entirely different banking system as far as the amount of leverage in the system uh, and, and counterparty risk and other very complicated financial elements that were unique to the GFC. I can believe and do believe two things at once, that we are due for a housing price correction and that it is not something synonymous with what happened in 08. And so that's our theory. We're sticking to it. Feds, central banks all over, what are they doing about quantitative tightening? Uh, equities rallying as bond yields fell. We've been saying that one had to happen before the other did. It happened today. Will it be followed through on tomorrow and Friday? We don't know. We'll see. Um, it's immaterial long term, but obviously in the short term jitters that people have of the current market, uh, it, it, a lot of people have their eyes on it. You know we're going to have our eyes on it. It's what we do. Uh, I, my partner, Brian Seitel, will be bringing you the podcast and video tomorrow as I am up uh, at the Reagan Library. Um, I, I'm recording here for my hotel, but tomorrow, uh, ready for a big event. You'll hear more about it tomorrow. Read the dctoday.com. Get ready for a dividend cafe on Friday about tough markets. We're here for you. Thanks so much for listening to and watching the DC Today.